Cherokee Purple is one of the more resistant, um, disease resistant um, heirlooms because Cherokee Purple is one of those tomatoes with a potato leaf. And potato leaf potato tomatoes have flowers that are bigger by quite a bit than the regular tomatoes. And my good, good friend Lee Barnes, um, who is a seed saving expert, I asked him one time about a bean I had that was crossing. He said, oh yeah, it's promiscuous. I love the term, right? I think it's Lee's term. I don't know that's out there, right? There are cross-pollinating varieties and these species that are largely self-pollinating. Tomatoes are largely able to pollinate themselves. They don't need another variety to pollinate. Right? The plant gets shook and it's got its own pollen in the flower. And so it pollinates itself, right? And so very rarely do you get tomatoes to cross by accident. They don't need a big spacing in the garden to select varieties, right? Cherokee purple and other potato leaf varieties are promiscuous. You say there, see, the first time I saved them yet, Every, I can see characteristics of every kind of tomato I grew up you know, And only one or two look like Cherokee and Cherokee Purples. Right? So last year, I purposely put some Cherokee Purples in our Defiant rub Because I'd love to get some Defiant resistance into my Cherokee Purple. And what we grow up, what the other plant? Defiant. Defiant is a Randy Gardner um, heritage, I would say. I, I mean, by the time Johnny's got it, they work with other people at NC State, but he started that program of developing late flight resistant tomatoes. And they even acknowledged that they got their genetics from North Carolina State University. But it was developed by um, Johnny Selected Seed. And it's darn resistant to Alton area. And I don't know about late flight because we didn't get it last year. But probably it is resistant because I know that the other ones are going to be garnered about work. And so by breeding it into Cherokee Purple, which is already disease resistant, we might come up with an even better heirloom. Or we might come up with a more tasty divine. We'll just see. But this year I will probably look to get some Downy Mill resistant cucurbits. I know they're out there, and indeed, we had some that were resistant, and the infection was so bad last year it didn't stop. But they did last a little longer. You know? And so, you know, because Downing Hill is getting to be a problem, I'd recommend looking at the catalog to see which ones say Downing Hill do, Downing Hill do resistant. You know, I'm never much worried about powdery, powdery mildew resistant cucurbits. I've always managed to keep the powdery mildew off my plants long enough to get good crops. You know, I spray them with mill stop, you know, and get new sprays, but that's the next subject anyways. Mill stop is um, potassium bicarbonate. And I've heard people, some people use sodium bicarbonate. And they say it's somewhat effective. There's not a registered fungicide that is sodium bicarbonate. It might function the same way, but potassium bicarbonate is a legal fungicide, and that's useful for more than one reason. If you're legal, if you're selling food, you probably don't want to use illegal fungicides. Um, if you're growing it at home, they're probably not going to come after you. you know? Never spray, unless it's the heat of the day, and I just have to stop down in the or something, I'm spraying at a time I don't want to. I only want to spray in the cool of the day. Less chance of plants being burned by my spray, and also less chance of, uh, I mean, uh, not less chance, a little more time before the, before the, the organic sprays, which aren't long lasting, are broken down. Because strong UV rays, right, when the sun is stronger, are going to start to break down process. Now, these things wouldn't be for sale if they didn't work despite the UV effect. But, I mean, if you use organic sprays, you know that they don't last like conventional sprays. So by waiting to spray, you know, when the sun is past, like 6 o'clock in the summer or something, or before 9 in the, in the morning, you know, or at this time of year, it's less of a point, less of an issue. But, you know, waiting to spray that is better, okay? Also, if you do that, it's high, much more likely that the um, stomata on the plants, the, the spore, the, the, whole, the pores on the underside of the leaves will be open. And that gives me the opportunity to do one more thing when I spray it, do a foliar feed. So I always add fish and seaweed to my thermix, to my spray. They say always with those exceptions, like oxidate and ceramic, right? Um, and by doing that, what I'm doing is doing a foliar feed. I want to cover all of the leaf surfaces when I spray, right? 
That means I'm going to get the bottom of the leaf surface very well. That's where the food's going in. Stuff on the top, that's going to be food for was on there, but it's not going in. And it'll wash off on the ground and can be food down there. But I always add that to my sprays, and you know, the evidence of its success is the thing I spray most regularly all year, and it's off topic, it'll be discussed in July, is squash that aren't in the Machado family are the um, mixed up family, the butternut and the Kushaw families. Any squash that's not in those families, which is all the summer squash, I spray them twice a week with BT and soap at the base of the plant to control my work. But I'm doing that, right, with a sprayer that dusts up totally underneath it. It's a sprayer that just makes a cloud. So when I'm pointing at the base, all that stuff is missing out and covering the bottom of the leaves. So I always put the Thermex, the fish, and the seaweed in my spray. And my squash plants, why do I put them three feet apart? They're like this. They're huge. You know, I've had agents and all kinds of people say, look at the size of those squash plants, you know. Well, they're only getting fully sprayed twice a week. And I wouldn't do it, I wouldn't do it to feed them. I mean, if you, there's other ways to get lots of squash, it's not a hard thing to do, you know. But as long as I'm keeping the vine borer off, I want maximum nutrition for maximum flavor for sale, you know. If you've got the most, you know, the highest uh, amount of nutrition, then you're going to have the highest uh, nutrition in that fruit, and that fruit is going to have the best flavor. So that's why I do it. That sounds a little off the... Uh... Off the label sort of recipe. Do you have a particular recipe for the fish and the seaweed? And the well, yeah, it's um, it's actually it is like it's two tablespoons per gallon. Okay. Yeah. So you follow the recipe of um, two tablespoons of the gallon of the fish and then and, yeah. quarter tablespoon of the gallon for the, the thermex, thermex. And then you you know most Just of the pesticides, the most of the pesticides, not all, but most of them are also two tablespoons per gallon. Not always. You got to read it and check. But a lot more. But just, you know, you, you definitely want to read and use the right amount. You know? Are you using it a recommended strength with all these? You don't use like lower strength? Or... Um, you know, I sometimes go a little easier up, so, because I don't want to hurt the beneficials, you know. But I want to be sure that I'm killing the eggs of anybody that didn't hatch out. So that they, if they hatch out, right, and they are eating the BT before I get back to spray again, they, 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 might get, they might get inside. I don't know. I'm not sure. You know. So by using the BT in the soap, I know the idea of the soap is it's still the eggs. I know the idea of the BT is anybody's alive, it's outside, it hasn't gotten in yet, right? You take one bite, paralyzed stomach. So twice a week you're doing the BT soap and the fish and fish and seaweed yeah. 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 on the base of my squash. Yeah. And I don't start until sometime in this year. We'll probably start in mid May. Normally it'd be like early July, early June. Yeah. Because the vine board doesn't come out that early. Kind of soap do you use? I use I use MP, which is the farmer's version of Sanders and Second Side of Soap. MP. Yeah, if you were which I don't recommend if you're doing it for you know professional. But home growers don't get regulated. And if you want it's not technically legal, you're supposed to not use something as a pesticide if it's not registered with EPA. But years ago, Rodeo tested soaps and the least phytotoxic toxic was I3 plates. Good luck to dissolve it. I say soak them overnight really well. What about Dr. Browns? Dr. Browns, I don't know if it's been tested. It should be pretty mild. But I don't know. I've never used it, you know. Um, is there a before getting you it? It's so much. I used it in for like scale and the uh, it didn't have. And orchid. It didn't hurt the grass. It's good. Well, um, yeah, certain plants always have, um, you know, like yeah. one plant will consistently get the scale back all the time. But mm -hmm. overall, it works. works well. Which one? Peppermint? Um, I think I used peppermint. Which might also, I mean, mints are insecticidal too, so that might also help. There's another question. Oh, is it for organic MP to serve as armor group? So it's a, it's a group I'm not, I'm not mentioning anything. There's not, this is organic disease. Yeah. Anything I mentioned, so you can use. That, that brings up the question for me. Compost teas are not. Yeah, they are. If the compost is made properly. Okay. So if you, if, you get, if you get approved. Like macro compost, compost is a lot. You know? Okay, so then I can, I can. That's something I've been asking people if they did. Yeah, they are. We had a big fight. Who's talking? 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 Who's talking?
take measurements every day of the temperature and you know, record it every day. Yeah, that's the way you can go to find those temperatures. Yeah. 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 Or you can get a bag of that stuff from your friend. The macro. The macro has met, has met those, those standards, and so you can use that. And that, by the way, you really, it was a big boom I created by somebody who's quite smart and knows a whole lot of stuff, but gets a little bit out there sometimes. And he worked with somebody in Beltsville, a researcher, and they used a brewer that didn't aerate very well. And they used, they admitted, not good cow compost. Now, if, you, if you're using something not good means not well composted, then you have a pathogen there. And then if you don't give it enough of air, right, the pathogens that they're worried about, right, are pathogens that bother humans. Those are all pathogens that do very well in anaerobic conditions of our stomachs. Right? They don't do very well in highly aerated conditions. So if you have proper aeration, they're probably food for the good guys you're brewing. Right? But instead, what happened was the aeration wasn't good, and they put pathogens in there. That's called brew pathogens. You know? So that that we had to we had to do a whole lot of like letters and stuff. The proper aeration, like I've got before I was doing organic growing, up, I did it like you know, I would do a five gallon bucket, stuff in the sack, and then they um, query. The sack is off the top the bottom, right? Okay, and one one quart bubbler or two quart bubbler? It was actually, I think I ended up getting a second one, and I had four total hoses going down. That's then you probably had proper aeration. Yeah, bro. I like to, um. We just talked this last, last, last session. Um, I like to get the, uh, the, the little plug that lets me put two little stones and stick it right in the bottom of the bag. So oh. the air is blowing through the bag, because that gets better extraction. And it ensures that none of the compost, because that compost is denser. So that might actually get a pathogen that might find its way to the edge and then get off, you know? And there are some cheap ones process to further reduce pathogens. Is that what I should look up? I want to learn so you run What the standards are. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what you can look up, yeah. Okay. That's, you just, it's, but actually, it is the same standard that's in the NLP. They just took the FRP and put it in NLP, so you look up with NLP too. NLP means National Organic Program, for anybody that doesn't know. Um, but yeah, you want to be sure you have good compost or certain you're only using work testing. And I've decided, since I want to be able to use worm castings for tea, that I will not use manure in my bedding. Now I have no source of the human pathogen, right? Just plant pathogens, which don't affect us, you know? Mostly. This morning is a genetic engineering about that. We won't go there now. That's a very complex discussion. Are but there mostly, any organic brand worm casting here? Um, you can get worm castings, I'm sure, that would meet organic standards. You just have to talk about the process. They, could, they would have to certify to you they used no bedding, it wasn't allowed. For example, we bought worm castings, we got a great big deal, had a bunch of worm castings, we got certified. And we got that worm, that worm separated out there, we saw, right? And it turned out that we couldn't call organic, we used the water for those doesn't matter anymore, I wasn't here then, I was surprised. Because they used cardboard as a bedding. Now, until I learned that, I used cardboard as a bedding. There's something that Andre says you can't use for that. You know? So you just have to find out what the standards are. The glue, but yeah, I, I personally question that. I mean, you know, I get it why we have to do it because there's no synthetics allowed, etc., etc. Et but that glue, by the time it goes to a worm's gut and then gets into the soil with all the microbial light, it ain't glue no more. What about shredded paper? You know, you yeah, think they allow, pretty sure they allow uncolored paper. And again, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can use that. I use rotted right straw. You know, that's why I show. I get straw, I set it out, I let them get rotty, and I use a little water. Yeah. Hmm. And if you don't put any manure in the compost, you don't have to worry about it. Well, you worry what's less. But can you be sure that a mouse didn't go through the pile? Mm -hmm. Can you be sure, you know, if you have the right heat, yeah. you know, yeah. and indeed the right aeration, yeah. you know, I would, I would venture that some E. coli 157. You know, I would bet my life on it, not anybody else's, but my life, right? I'd be happy to eat salad mix that if it's sprayed with compost tea, right? If it was well-made compost and it was properly aerated, right? I wouldn't wash it off. In fact, I haven't washed it off. And I've been fine. 
Okay, even though we can't guarantee that there wasn't some road in the traffic loop that had some E fifty one seven one fifty seven. I mean E E one fifty seven. Yeah. I mean I'm not worried about it because I'm saying the conditions were, but that guy is almost certainly going to get eaten. That's what you want to be sure. Don't put a load of pathogens in your brewer and don't brew it improperly. You know? If you do that, I don't think you have to worry about it. And if that compost met PFRP, there's no guarantee to be PFRP that there's not going to be a little bit of E. coli there. It's, it, to be legal, right? To meet state standards and sell that compost, they allow 1,000. 250 or 1,025 parts per million of a pathogen. And that compost can be sold. If that compost is met PFRP, it can be used for you know, That means that your process of brewing stuff is also ensuring that you don't have a problem. You know? Now, there are people that want, not, want to stop that. I guarantee you, the food safety people, they want to put compost tea in a box, lock it, and never look at it again. They do not want life on your food. You have it. They, not, they think the solution to safe food is dead food. Radiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. radiation. Yeah, exactly. That's going to be safe food. And then, ironically, they can do that. In fact, that's why some of the meat outbreaks happen, because they make the food so sterile that then one little bit of E. coli splashes up from somebody that messed up somehow, and boom, it goes like crazy and multiplies. You know? Awesome. It's just a straight up idea I've had about it. Compost tea. What, I mean, obviously it's not really necessary, but would it make sense to maybe add molasses to that? I well, you, I mean, when you brew, you add a little bit of molasses. Oh, I've never done that. Yeah, that makes way more microbes. Way, very little. Though. Don't overdo it. You know, five gallon bucket. Don't get over a quarter cup. I think you're better off with three tablespoons. Yeah. Um, you can also ask to add things like fish emulsion, um, rock dust, azomite. Um, those are all small amounts. Tablespoon kind of amounts, um, seaweed, soluble seaweed, all those things are going to, that diversity of foods will greatly improve your compost tea. Greatly improve it. Yeah. Um, and yes, it does make sense. I wouldn't add it at the spray point because right. it's not the end of the season and you might be setting up, you know, blooms of stuff that will start you eating. Spray your food, your plants for sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. So some people do sometimes, yes. What's the name of the toxin that gets you from four you can three B? Oh, um botulisms. Yeah. yeah. All right. What about H one fifty seven? I've got this from bacteriology. Mm -hmm. Is that that's E. coli that picks up the genes to make that toxin. Ah. That's why the H one fifty seven is so bad, yeah. It's so bad. Ordinary E. coli, you could take them, you know, and let you have a overdose of well, not going to make it seriously sick. Well, and that's a neurotoxin. And, and it's, it's a dead all yeah. there, and it goes right through you. Yeah. Um, and it brings up a, a, a thing for all of us to, to reflect on. We live in a world that is anti-micro, and it sets us up for bigger and bigger falls all the time. Because we know bacteria exchange genetics. And when you create situations, right, where there, there are opportunities for bacteria to suddenly get a clean slate, no competition, right? Those new forms, which may not be particularly viable, right, in natural evolution, they may never have made it, they get to boom, they get to take off. 